Welcome to our quarterly Liberty Technical Update session. This is the first session of 2022. My name is Lars Bessmann and I'm part of the EMEA team for application modernization. Today we will talk about Liberty 2001, 2 and 3. As always, the session will be recorded. First, we'll talk about uh, the history a bit of uh, what, what is the difference between tradition and liberty. We'll talk about liberty enhancement and then we'll do a Q&A session. So please ask your, uh, your question during the session. Today we have two speakers, Alison Nottingham, who is a Liberty Runtime Architect, and Graham Charters, who is a Wilson Liberty Technical Product Manager. So without further introduction, I will now hand over to Graham. Graham, the stage is yours. Thank you, Lars. Um, so we thought we'd um, change things up a little bit. Um, so quite, we, we, as part of these sessions, we normally have a 20-minute uh, intro. Uh, to Liberty. Um, so I'm going to cover that um, in maybe a slightly different approach, um, just because I'll, I'll talk a little bit, as Lars said, a little bit about the history, um, the evolution of the runtimes to help kind of understand how Liberty and traditional web, web sphere re relate to each other, how we, how we think about the runtimes and how that influences the direction that we're taking them in. Um, and then I'm going to do a demo um, that'll take maybe 15, 20 minutes. Um, which will highlight some of the things, some of the benefits of Liberty, but also some of the things that we've delivered over the past kind of six or so months. Uh, and then I'll hand over to Alistair, as Lars said, and he'll do the what, what's new this quarter and, and uh, we'll cover the Q&A after that. Although you can ask questions during during the session and there are other people that uh, uh, will, able, will be able to answer them as, as we go. All right, so I, I like to um, use a, the history of the run times to kind of help understand um, understand the differences between, for example, traditional web sphere and liberty, so web sphere and open liberty. Um, I think the history helps uh, helps in terms of understanding what shaped those run times, why we created them and, and why they exist, how, how they are, and why we're taking them in the directions we're taking them. And so, you're on a on a on a quarterly liberty update, so you're probably fairly familiar with some some of the some of the history around the WebSphere product portfolio. Traditional WebSphere um, started out in the late 1990s as an implementation of what became the Java e specifications. At the time, it was just essentially a servlet container, and then it evolved over the years um, to, to kind of around the 2010 timeframe. And uh, in in that time frame, many many new specs had been created, and, and each runtime is required to implement all of those specifications. So you essentially ended up with uh, a monolithic runtime for deploying and running monolithic applications. So we didn't call them monoliths at the time because we didn't really have other types of or other styles of applications. Um, but because of the increased pressure for kind of time to value, the ability to deliver applications and new applications and updates to applications more rapidly, we created WebSphere Liberty. And WebSphere Liberty, as you're, you're probably aware, is a small lightweight kernel with each of the individual capabilities that can be plugged into that uh, into that kernel. So you can indeed build a full uh, Java -E or Jakarta -E distribution. Um, of Liberty, but you can also create smaller cut down distributions, if you like, that fit exactly the needs of your application. And it happens that this is the model um, that the industry has kind of evolved towards when it comes to the concepts of things like cloud native and microservices. So in a kind of traditional app server view of the world, you have your server runtime, you manage that, you install fixes into that. It's a kind of first class en operational uh, entity. And then you deploy app applications, maybe one or more applications into that into that uh, that server runtime. Whereas when you move to more of a containers and microservices based approach, the application becomes the kind of focal point or the, the, the thing you focus on. And then everything else comes along for the ride. So uh, for example, you might you develop your application, you put it in, in a container, and then underneath that application, you've got things like the runtime, you've got the JVM, you've got the OS layer and so on. And, and because Liberty can be tailored to fit exactly the needs of, of the runtime, and, we'll, and I'll show that in the demo, you can essentially focus on your application and have just the pieces of Liberty come into your container that are required for that application. And this is great for microservices um, because if you think about it, if you move to microservices, maybe you've got tens or hundreds more instances, you need those runtimes to be lightweight and fit exactly the needs of the application. And so we, that's that's essentially how we're evolving Liberty in, in that direction. So supporting containers in a first-class way, Kubernetes, 
Um, and what we saw in the kind of 2016-17 timeframe was a lot of increase, increased um, demand for open source. And so we open sourced WebSphere Liberty as Open Liberty. Open Liberty is the full production ready, uh, full production ready runtime, and you can get support for that through the WebSphere licenses. So where that leaves us is we have essentially two runtimes, traditional WebSphere and Liberty in the form of WebSphere Liberty and the open source Open Liberty. And the focus for these two runtimes is different. So when we talk to our customers about traditional WebSphere and what their requirements are, um, we overwhelmingly hear that they want stability. They want their existing applications to continue to work. They're the kind of workhorse of their enterprise. They don't want those applications to have to go through um, migration exercises because they don't actually want to be making may, uh, maybe significant changes to most of their, those applications. So that's the focus we have for traditional web sphere. It's essentially ensure existing workloads continue to work with minimal impact uh, and min minimal disturbance. And so that's why we did the, the Java 8 um, uh, traditional web sphere announcement, essentially saying we will continue to support Java 8 till at least 2030 um, for traditional web sphere. Uh, now, we can't just kind of say, OK, the runtime's stable. That's great. We'll move on. Um, because those applications and those servers run inside an environment where things around them are changing. So the operating systems continue to evolve. Databases continue to evolve. Security standards evolve. There are security vulnerabilities discovered and so on. So we're essentially still evolving traditional web sphere, but the focus is on ensuring that it the APIs are stable, but we continue to make sure we support the latest operating systems, databases, and security, and so on. On the Liberty side, um, the focus is on, on enabling cloud-native applications. So it's supporting lightweight and efficient execution, because if you're going to microservices, as I said, you need those runtimes to be small and efficient. Um, it's supporting the latest API technologies for new applications and so on. Um, and supporting containers and Kubernetes, because it's quite clear that these are the kind of leading technologies that are being adopted when it comes to, to doing cloud native applications. And then the third the third thing we see customers doing, so they're, they're stable applications on traditional web sphere, new cloud native applications on Liberty. The third thing we see them doing is evolving existing traditional web sphere applications to Liberty, so modernizing them. And, and so what we've done is essentially enabled through hybrid edition and also if you're familiar with cloud Pat for applications enabled those those three three uh three strategies if you like so we have in hybrid edition cloud Pat for apps we have the traditional web sphere entitlement we have the liberty entitlement we have support for the underlying java and we also have the tran have the modern app modernization tool so we have transformation advisor um, for doing analysis of your existing applications and helping identify which target runtimes are most appropriate and any any work you may need to do in order to move them between those runtimes. We have the WebSphere application migration tools, which help you with your their plugins into Eclipse that help you with any code changes you need to make. And then Mono to Micro, which is unique to Hybrid Edition, is a tool which will analyze your existing applications um, so you can understand the structure and it will help identify and make recommendations for how to break a monolithic application into microservices and generate some starter code for those microservices. Uh, and also, uh, although not covered here, and I think we may have had had sessions on it, um, WebSphere Automation, um, which helps you with your uh, things like your your security posture of your existing deployment. So understanding what CVEs you have or, or vulnerabilities you may have in your existing deployments, helping you identify fixes and so on for those things. So that's the kind the kind of history and the kind of how we how we wrap the the kind of customer needs up into the, into, uh, the single hybrid edition offer, off, offering. Um, but focusing specifically on Liberty, um, one of the things we wanted to do earlier this, or, well, earlier last year actually, was to be able to articulate the benefits of Liberty. Um, and to help us do that, we commissioned an independent study from Forrester Research. Um, and what Forrester did is they interviewed a number of our customers and did some analysis. They create what they call a composite customer, a kind of average customer based on those interviews. And then they write a report. We're not responsible for the calculations. We can feed back when um, certain kind of information is maybe maybe not accurate or not clear, um, but we don't influence the data and we're not involved in the interviews. And what they found was in, the, in this, what they call a total economic impact study, what they found was that um, uh, essentially 
developers experienced a 50% increase in productivity when they moved from traditional WebSphere to Liberty. Um, IT admins um, achieved a 40% increase in productivity. And actually going through that modernization exercise, um, they achieved, the, cust the customers on average achieved 195% return on investment and they got payback within eight months. And there are many, many reasons why, why they see these benefits. There are various things we've done around developer experience, and we've had sessions talking a little bit about those. Um, so things like um, dev mode for rapid inner loop, and I'll demonstrate that um, uh, uh, shortly. Um, how we optimize and uh, make it easy to build for, for containerized environments. Uh, things like zero migration that help with moving uh, essentially moving up levels of Liberty without having to change your application code or change your server configuration. On, on the more kind of operational side of things, Liberty with its auto tuning capabilities, so you don't have to tune the thread pool, it does that for you, gives you optimum performance, um, whatever the environment it finds itself in. And if that environment changes over time, it continues to optimize and get the best performance. Um, we've also got uh, uh, a Kubernetes, a full level five based, uh, uh, sorry, a full level five capable Kubernetes operator um, for doing deployments. It greatly simplifies, greatly reduces the amount of configuration you have to provide in order to do a deployment into a Kubernetes environment. So that helps reduce the kind of skills gap between where a lot of uh, a lot of our WebSphere customers are today, where they're doing traditional WebSphere operations, um, to getting to the point where they can do Kubernetes based operations in a Kubernetes environment or OpenShift, for example. And then on the app modernization side, of course, we do a lot of work around um, making the migration and modernization from traditional WebSphere to Liberty uh, as easy as possible. So we, we're continually evolving the API set in Liberty to help, help smooth that migration, continually improving the tools to help with configuration, migration, and so on. And of course, we because Liberty um, can run monolithic applications as well as microservices and running VMs as well as containers. It's a great environment for modernization because you can actually stage your moves. You can you can move to Liberty in virtual machines and then in containers and then to microservices, or you can move traditional WebSphere into containers, then Liberty in containers, and then break your monolithic application into microservices. It's not a, a big bang rewrite, which is always going to be more risky. Okay, um, so I've talked for uh, probably longer than I uh, longer than I meant to. So what I'd like to do is uh, is now um, do a demo, uh, and in the demo, I'm going to demonstrate some of the things we've talked about. So I'll uh, I'll do four things. One is create a new microservice project using the the Liberty Starter, which was I think uh, something we did in fourth or third quarter last year. Um, I'll use Dev Mode to do some code development, so you'll see the rapid in a loop capabilities. I'll use the, the generated Docker file to build a container and talk a little bit about how that standard or, or default Docker file, if you like, um, optimizes the container for production and makes it uh, a container that fits exactly the needs of your application. And then I'll deploy the application to the Azure Kubernetes service, all, all being well. All right, so I'm just going to close the slides. And I'm going to move StreamYard away so it doesn't cause us any problems. But hopefully, you can still see my browser. Um, OK, so the first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to go to the Liberty Starter. And this Liberty Starter is essentially, there are other starters out there. Um, they do similar things. I like the Liberty one. It's quite nice and simple. Um, and what this does is it will generate you a new project. Um, so you, it, it provides a default um, for the group name and artifact ID. I'm going to uh, call this Liberty Cloud Demo. Um, and you can choose whether you want the build to be Maven or Gradle. You can choose the version of Java you want to use. I've got Java 11 on my laptop, so that's what I'm going to use. And you can use the level, choose the level of Java e and Jakarta e, um, so or, or none, in fact. Um, so I'm going to stick with the latest and stick with the latest for MicroProfile. Um, so MicroProfile for doing microservices, for example. And I'm going to generate that project. And what I get is a zip file, which I can open. And I'm, I'm not going to show anything on here. So let's just open a terminal window. It'll be easier to see. And that's opened on the wrong screen. And so if we just have a look, we can see what we've got generated. So there's a readme with some instructions. There's a Docker file for building the container. 
Um, there's a Maven wrapper file for doing my Maven builds. There's the pom.xml for doing the Maven build. It's the, essentially the, the more detailed, the, the instructions for how to build this project and some source code. So what I'm gonna do now is I'll take a look at that source code in, in Visual Studio Code. Okay, and so we can see that this is the code that got generated and it's very, very uh, sparse because we, we actually surveyed our customers and said, do you want us to generate lots of code or or, or minimal code so you don't have to delete any? Uh, and they they said that it was, it was close, but uh, most in favor of de um, generating minimal code. So we generate a REST application, um, but there are no resources or anything generated. And we also generate the Cert Liberty server configuration file. So you can see, uh, let me just make it a little bit bigger. Um, actually, I'm, <laughs> that, that might be a little bit too big for me. So hopefully you can see this okay. Uh, and you can see I selected Jakarta 9 and MicroProfile, so that's what I've got. But actually what I'm going to do, because I'm just going to generate a, or sorry, create a RESTful web service, um, I'm going to change that to be just a REST service. Okay, and so I can... The, the other thing I've got here is I've got the Liberty Developer Tools already installed, so I can start my server. And what this is doing is it's that I you, you may have noticed I don't haven't actually installed Liberty locally or anything. So what this is doing is part of the build. It's pulling down the kernel image, um, so we can see it's pulling down the latest 20, uh, 22003 image. And it's then going to install any features I require on top of it. So this is installing the, the RESTful Web Services 3.0 feature. Uh, and it's pulling that down from Maven Central. So I don't need to do any additional work or anything. It's, it's uh, it essentially building that runtime up for me. And all I had was a, a, Maven, uh, a Maven build uh, instructions. OK, so it's done that. And it started the server. So I can go and now hit the endpoint. And we can see there's nothing there. And the reason there's nothing there is because we haven't got a REST resource yet. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to create that REST resource. And that REST resource, I'm going to cheat a little bit. I'm going to take some code that's actually used in, in the Open Liberty Guides, um, which is just going to return the system properties for my service, uh, well, for my laptop. So I've made those changes and I can go and hit the endpoint again. Uh, let me just refresh this. And we can see there's still nothing here. And that's because I'm not actually at the right location. But then even when I am at the right location, uh, I can see that uh, it's complaining because I don't have the ability to write JSON. And we can see that this, this service says it produces JSON. So I've not configured that into the server. And so what I'll do is I'll just add that feature. I think it's 2.0. Let me just check my crib sheet. Uh, in the wrong bit. Oh, let's go with it. If it doesn't like it, I can always. Okay, so I've just saved that server configuration, and it's it's basically identified that the feature is uh, is not uh, not currently installed, so it's going to install that feature. Um, it doesn't need to install the RESTful web service feature because that's already there. And we've got our update and I can now go and refresh my page. And there we go. This is the system properties returned in JSON format for my um, for my service. So we, we can see this, the, the, the kind of dev mode capability is really nice because I can change my server configuration I can, and have features just come and go at, based on what I need. Um, and I can modify my application code and have that code um, automatically um, reflected in the running server. I don't need to do any restarts of servers, any reinstallation of anything manually. Um, I don't have to do any redeploys or anything. Okay, um, so that's that's the kind of dev mode experience. The next thing I want to do is build uh, a container. So I'm going to look. This is the Docker file that was generated for me. And just briefly, I'll, I'll talk about it more later. But um, what we can see is it's copying a war file across into the into the apps directory as part of the uh, the building of the container. Um, but if I look in my target directory, I can see there is no war file, and that's because the way Dev Mode works is it essentially assembles a logical application based on files on your file system. So there is no war file at this point. Um, so what I need to do is I need to build that war file. 
So if I now look in the target directory, we can see I've now got this wall file. So I can kick off my Docker build and then we can talk about um, uh, the uh, uh, talk about the Docker file. Oops. Okay. All right. So the Docker file we get um, by default from the starter, it starts from uh, from a, a Liberty image that we produce that we publish into the IBM container registry. We also publish into Docker Hub, um, but Docker Hub rate limiting can sometimes cause problems. Um, so we're just using the IBM container registry here. It's the kernel image, so it doesn't have the additional features uh, already installed. Um, and it's Java 11, using the OpenJ9 JVM, which gives us much better performance um, than Hotspot, and it's based on UBI. We also build a Ubuntu images. We also provide the Docker files um, for you to build your own images as well, and you're still supported if you do that. What we do is we then copy across the config directory, and in that config directory, you can see here is the server XML. Um, and then we run this features command. And what this features command does is it essentially looks at that server XML and builds a and essentially installs the additional features that are required for this application. Um, so in this case, it's going to be installing JSONB and it's going to be installing the RESTful web service features um, because that's all my application needs. So there's no additional bloat in this container. It's going to fit, fit exactly the needs of my application. And then we copy across the WAR file. And then what we do is we run this configure command. And this configure, uh, configure script is essentially going to to warm the container, if you like. It starts the server up, shuts it down so that um, class caches get populated and so on, so that when you come to deploy this into production, it starts much, much faster. Um, so that's, that's it. essentially we're paying a small cost during build time, and you wouldn't normally do this on your laptop. You'd have it as, as part of some build on a build system. Um, you play the, pay the small cost at build time so that you get much better per, um, performance in production for startup. OK, so I built the container. Um, I can test that that runs. So uh, whoops. if I could type, I could test it runs. OK, so we're going to start that container up. Um, I should have mentioned, um, so I showed dev mode not running in a container. Dev mode actually also works with containers, so I can do start in container. Um, and it starts up the experience inside a container. So you can get near production developer experience, essentially. If you're deploying in containers, it's better to develop and test in a container as well. So that, that server's all started up. And uh, um, essentially, it'll be available at the same location. So if I refresh, there you go. And you can see, hopefully, you noticed that the system property values changed because this is now inside my container rather than running directly on my Mac. OK. Um, normally, when you control C, if you're using Docker, it uh, it kills off the the container. But I'm using Podman, and I've aliased it to Docker, so uh, I need to do I need to just stop that container running. Okay, all right. Um, so I've started created a new service. I've cr uh, done some development. I built it in a container, um, and now I want to um, deploy that to uh, to a, a cloud environment. And what I'm, where I'm going to deploy that to is the Azure Cloud. I have an instance up there. I'm going to uh, what I'm going to do. So um, I've already provisioned a, an instance of the Azure Kubernetes service. It takes about 15 minutes to do that. Um, I'm not going to demo that. Um, I'm going to just set some environment variables that just make it easier for me to uh, to to have reusable commands for demo purposes. So I'm setting the cluster name for my instance, the Azure Container Registry name for my instance, and the resource group name for my for my deployment. Um, and then what I'm, I need to do, I need to do some uh, steps to, to essentially uh, get the right place in my instructions. Uh, login, so I need to uh, log into Azure uh, so that I can push things up to the Azure environment. Uh, because uh, I've restarted my browser, this is probably going to it'll log me in, but it'll state it'll say that uh, I don't have any. Uh, so that's going to work, but this bit isn't. So I just need to do one thing. Assuming this fails, yeah, there we go. No subscriptions found. So what I need to do, because it requires 
two-factor uh, two authentication, I need to log into the Azure portal first. Okay, just need to get my authenticator app. <laughs> Okay, I can use that page later, so that's good. So we'll log back in again. And it should be happy. Okay, there we go. Uh, all right, so the next thing I want to do is I want to connect to my cluster. So you'll see this is why I'm using those environment variables that I set. It just makes it easier. If I provision a different cluster, I don't have to create new commands that I can copy and paste. Um, I'm going to log into my Azure Container Registry. This one takes a few seconds. I'm not sure why this one's particularly long, but anyway. What are we doing for time? Not too bad. Okay, uh, and then we can... Uh, have a look at the images we've got and we can see this is the image I built and I want to tag one that I'm going to push up into the Azure container registry. So I'm just going to tag that image and we can see it's now tagged um, for that uh, container registry instance. So now I'm going to push that image up and whilst that's going, um, we can have a little look at the Azure cloud. All right. So this is the, uh, the Azure portal. Uh, and we can look at what resource groups there are. So this is the resource group I'm using, which has my deployment in it. Uh, this is my Azure Container Registry instance, and this is my uh, Azure cluster, and you can uh, go and look at monitoring information and so on. Um, let's go back to the, if we look at the Azure Container Registry, you can see what images are in the Container Registry. This is the image I'm pushing up at the moment. Um, and it looks like it might have done it. Yes, it has. Um, so we can see that it was last updated at uh, 1.29 p.m. GMT, which is the time now. Um, so that was quicker than I expected. Um, so I've got the image up there and now I need to do a deployment. Um, and if I look um, at what's in that Kubernetes environment, I've just aliased kubectl to k. Um, so that's a kubectl command. Um, then what we will see is I've got the Open Liberty operator running. Um, and so what I can do, actually, let's just have a quick look in here, one of the things I wanted to show. Um, so if we go in deployments, the, these are the things that ran to do this deployment. And if you look at the, the one that took 10 minutes, which is doing the main deployment, then there are some outputs. And these outputs are useful commands, useful things to help you do your deployment. One of those things is a base64 encoded um, value, which is essentially the, the Docker file, or sorry, not the, it's the deployment YAML for the, um, uh, for the, for, for the doing a deployment using the operator. Um, now I've, I've already got a copy, which I've kind of templatized for demo purposes. So I'm going to just copy that in here. And because it says kind open liberty application, that means it's use, it's something that the open liberty operator is going to be looking for. I've just given it a, a name and a default namespace. Um, this is the image it's going to pull. I'm going to replace as part of my can, command that value with the value for the Azure Container Registry, my, my Azure Container Registry instance. Uh, and so what I can do now is if you weren't templatizing it how I've done, you wouldn't have to do this said command. This said command is just going to replace ACR name with the, the environment variable that I already set. If you were doing it um, just using the value that you got straight out of the portal page that I showed, then you just do um, kubectl apply minus f and then the file name and you'd be done. Um, so we'll kick that off and then we'll watch the pods. Oops, did I did I just mess that up? I think I did. Oh, <laughs> my usual trick, I forget to save the file. There we go. Uh, so let's try that again. The number of times I've done that is ridiculous. I think I do it more often than I than I can get it right. So now we can do Oh, 
And we can see we've already got the, the, the two instances that I configured in here, the two replicas have already started up. Um, so what I need to do, so I've configured this particular instance um, to expose it, uh, an HTTP endpoint, this particular cluster. You probably wouldn't do that normally. You'd use something like Azure App Gateway. Um, I'll put that in front of the cluster. Um, but because I have, I can now go to this endpoint um, and I'll just replace that. Here we go. When I did this earlier today, it was very quick. There we go. And so that's the that's the response now from the instance running in the Azure Kubernetes service. Um, so that's it for the demo. Um, I'm going to hand over to Alistair. So just just to summarize, think what what I've tried to show is the kind of the the easy getting started through the starter to create a new project. Um, how Dev mode helps you with kind of rapid iterative iterative development of your code and configuration and so on. How easy it is to build a production ready container and then how easy it is to deploy to a Kubernetes environment using the the Liberty operator. Okay, that's me. Hi, Graham. Thank you for um, that the intro and demo. Um, and with uh, I'm immediately going to go on to the recent updates section. Um, so uh, I always like to show the um, this kind of overview chart of all of the features in Liberty. Uh, there are a lot. Um, I'm actually going to say it's not quite complete because there are a few features in Liberty that just didn't fit. Like there's some Java EE6 features that aren't on this chart. Um, but this is all kind of the, the most up-to-date and current. And um, anything that's green is things that have been delivered in the last quarter. So we'll talk about um, we'll talk about that in more detail in the next few slides. So if you come regularly to the quarterly update, you will know I talk about these uh, five focus areas. Um, we decided to slightly tweak the name of the, the, the five uh, focus areas. Uh, what's actually kind of meant by those hasn't changed, but um, what we are um, uh, what what we call them is different. So it's fundamentally no different from last time. We 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 have the API category for making sure you have the cloud native APIs that you need. We have the core runtime category uh, for improvements to the the core Liberty runtime to make sure it continues to be a a good runtime for cloud native applications. Uh, we have the cloud one, which is how we integrate it into things like Kubernetes. Um, but also um, how we integrate into kind of a, a, a um, in, in, into not just Kubernetes, but how you create containers, um, how how it works generally in the cloud. If you've got multiple servers, how they work together um, in in order to provide a higher kind of quality of service and high availability and so on. And then, of course, you know, developer experience is central to Liberty. We want to make sure that the experience of using Liberty to develop applications is a good one, and it's all underpinned by um, security. Now, um, every quarter we don't deliver something in all of these areas. Um, so, if we look at what we did in the last Liberty last quarter, um, we did a lot of stuff in core runtime, API, and security, and um, uh, we did some stuff, things, some things in developer experience, but I completely forgot to add them to the chart. Um, but the, I wasn't going to talk about them in detail anyway. So um, this is just a, a very quick overview of what's new in um, the last quarter, and probably uh, the biggest, uh, the biggest items, the three biggest items that we delivered were MicroProfile Five, which I'll talk about later, CommonJ Work Manager and Timer Support, and the thing that I forgot on here, which is JaxRPC. And I, I will talk about that later. So the first thing I wanted to kind of talk about is something that we've had people asking for a while. Um, Liberty, we have this file called the server.emv file. And previous um, in previous quarters, in previous releases of Liberty, there was no ability to do uh, variable expansion. So if you had, for example, if you define a server EMV of hostname variable, and then you wanted to find a URL that referenced the hostname, we would literally resolve that and pass it into the runtime as a HTTP kernel slash dollar curly brace hostname close curly brace. 
colon on TAT. And what people generally wanted to be able to do is get it to be replaced in. So in this example, it comes out as a.b.com rather than the host name. Now, there's a whole bunch of kind of complications um, for variable expansion. Um, the variable, the server MB is actually read in the shell. Um, so anything we do has to be something that works securely and correctly in the shell environment. And, um, and also enabling it could break backward compatibility. So um, it, as you know, as of new, the new releases, we do allow it, but you have to explicitly indicate that you want it um, to be enabled. And you do that by adding a comment that says enable variable expansion as shown on this. And then when we do that, we will do um, a resolution. Um, now this resolution is Unix specific, so it's not cross-platform, which is another reason for not turning it on because Generally speaking today, everything inside of um, server EMV could work on Windows or Linux. So you could move something from Windows to Linux. We don't generally see that happening very much, but it, it would work. But with the variable expansion, um, this this works on, uh, on, on Unix systems. It doesn't work on Windows. Um, the other thing is when you start doing variable expansion, you need to start escaping quotes um on on the unix system which you didn't have to do before when we don't have variable expansion turned on uh, we've updated the documentation to cover this and if you're on windows there's a slightly different syntax uh where you just put an exclamation mark bef before and after the variable name and that will allow you to um uh, expand and this is again it's windows specific because it's being processed by uh, the batch file and um, it, it's it's syntax that batch understands as opposed to something that that unix understands um another thing that we've done is uh we've added support um for something called a jwe and before i uh for open id connect and before i i talk about you know that aspect i just want to briefly recover what a json web token is uh, apparently, JSON Web Token gets pronounced JOT as an algorithm, as a as a short form. I, I don't know why, because I don't see where these O comes into it. But um, it's basically three different Base64 encoded sections separated by a period, and uh, two of those are JSON payloads. And this effectively tells you inf identity information about an end user. Um, and the last one is a signature, so you know that the the stuff in the in the payload hasn't hasn't changed. Now, uh, this is a, a a useful way, and quite often is used for transporting um, identity information around. Um, but if somebody actually gets hold of the the, the JWT, it's very easy for them to extract uh, the identity information. So there's a potential privacy um, implication here if these uh, these these tokens get get exposed. Um, so there's something called an encrypted JSON web token or um, JWE. Um, and this ends up um, with another, it's kind of a whole bunch more base 64 um, site bits. But the what, what this what this ends up doing is all of that JWS gets encrypted and placed into the fourth element in this basic five section base 64 item. And everything else it basically tells you how to do the decryption. Although, of course, it does not include the um, it doesn't include the uh, decryption key. So you have a decryption key uh, in in your um, uh, in your in your system, and as long as you have that decryption key, you can break it open. But if anyone else were to get this JWE, they wouldn't. And uh, we actually added support for JWE in some scenarios uh, a while back, but now we have support in our OpenID Connect uh, relying party. So that's basically the client part of OpenID Connect. So if you get sent a JWE as a bearer token and you're using OpenID Connect with our relying party, we can now pick it up and do the right thing with it, whereas beforehand um, we, we we couldn't. So it's a fairly kind of it's kind of when you state it like that, it's very simple. But of course, uh, these things generally are, are much more complicated to get working than than than, than necessarily what what works. Um, another thing in the security area that we've done um, with Liberty recently is we've added we've started signing 
um, our downloads. So if you go to the um, Open Liberty IO website, for example, um, the downloads from Open Liberty IO are signed um, and you can use OpenSSL in order to verify the signature. Um, what this allows you to do is very easily verify not only is this package, you know, the one that was you, you thought you were downloading, but you also know it was the one that was released by IBM and nothing has happened kind of in, in between um, uh, to interfere with it. Um, we, we, we sign it as part of our build system, so it's not kind of signatures not generated on download. <laughs> Um, we also sign the Webster Liberty binaries. So if you go to um, Fix Central, um, you will find that um, in addition to the zip file, you will find the signature file. And there's also a SHA-256 um, file. And, uh, and, and th those do exactly the same thing. And if you look at the kind of right side of the screenshot where it says public key, that's a link to uh, download the public key. So when I downloaded the public key to generate this example, I saved it in a file called signer.pm. That's not what it would be called if you downloaded it. In Central, I think it's kind of a much longer name, um, but I renamed it something shorter. And then um, you, you specify the signature and, uh, and the zip file name. And this allows you to kind of uh, verify that the, the thing you've downloaded hasn't you know, changed from uh, what IBM originally um, uh, provided, um, you know, it, it, it helps with kind of supply chain security concerns that some of our customers have. Um, we, we also, um, if you're consuming Liberty from Maven Central, uh, we actually put GPG signatures up into Maven Central. Uh, so there's a slightly different command for verifying those, which is documented uh, where in our kind of uh, IBM docs page on the signature process. Um, but uh, we've already spoken about this, so I don't have slides on it specifically. Um, so uh, micro profile five. So if you came to our last quarterly update, uh, you'll know we had a long discussion about Jakarta EE9 and what works with Jakarta EE9. So micro profile five was released um, very late uh, last year. And the main thing about Jakarta Microprofile 5 is that it updates all of the dependencies so it works with Jakarta EE9 instead of Jakarta EE8. Um, so if you've got existing applications that are making use of uh, Java EE or Jakarta EE, you would continue to use Microprofile 4 um, for those applications. But if you um, if you're starting to make use of Jakarta EE9, as some of our customers are, um, for new application workloads, you've got all of the support in micro profile. Um, all of the support in micro profile exists to um, to do integration into your cloud native runtimes. So if you want to use um, uh, 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 micro profile health because you're going to deploy into Kubernetes and you want to use a startup probe um, using the micro profile health APIs, you can now do that with Jakarta E9. So um, that's all available now. Um, there might be some minor kind of changes, but the big one is Microprofile 5 is updated to work Jakarta E9. So the last, few, the last two things I want to talk about are capabilities we've added to Web for Liberty. So they're not in Open Liberty. Uh, these are Web for Liberty kind of specific. But they are designed to make it easier for uh, existing kind of existing applications that may have been written some time ago that um, to run on top of um, Liberty. So if you've got applications on traditional WebSphere that use the common J work manager or timer, um, in the past those applications would have to be rewritten before they could move to Liberty. Um, now we've added some support for the common J work manager and timer, and that means that um, those applications can uh, move and run on top of Liberty. Uh, we still don't recommend customers use use concurrency utilities for, for uh, sorry, we still recommend that new applications use concurrency utilities for Java. Um, that's the that's kind of forward uh, looking um, API. 
Um, but for some applications, uh, use of things like uh, Common J Work Manager or the Quartz Scheduler is so pervasive through the application. Doing that kind of migration is 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 a is a big deal. So we've added support to Liberty for the Common J Work Manager and Timer. Um, so if you want to use the Common J Work Manager, you would configure the Concurrent 1.0 feature, which is the Concurrency Utilities in Java EE feature. And then you would also configure the Heritage APIs 1.1 feature. And the Heritage APIs 1.1 feature is basically a, a bunch of APIs that we don't encourage for new applications um, that, um, but, but, you know, are, are provided for that migration uh, purpose. And then you just configure the managed executor service in exactly the same way as you would for the concurrency utilities of Jakarta EE, um, but um, in, as well as it supporting um, being converted to a, um, an, a managed executor service, which is the uh, Java EE um, type, it can also be then assigned as a work manager. So if you look at the code example on the right, um, you'll see we're using an app resource to do a, to drive a lookup uh, of the work uh, work manager default into a work manager, and then you just use it in exactly the same way that you would use the work manager. Um, you cre create yourself a, an instance of work with a run method, and then you schedule it, and then you can wait for them all to be um, complete, um, or, or or whatever the API your application happens to use with the work manager. Um, CommonJ also has a concept of a timer, um, which is for when you want to schedule work um, it, at, at regular occurrences. Um, this uses the same uh, combination of features as the work manager, but um, because the um, because of the way that um, the CommonJ timer works, there isn't a, 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 an existing um, uh, thing that we can, you know, hook into from concurrency utils. So there is a new element, which is a common J timer manager, and it has a JNDI name and some configuration properties like max concurrency. And then again, you basically do your lookup and you can use that resource to drive the lookup, um, or you can do a direct JNDI lookup. And then you can um, implement a, a timer listener and you can perform lookups in the server namespace and do other things in the server namespace. Um, just as you would expect from WebSer traditional. And the last one is the Quartz timer. So Quartz is an, an old um, scheduling API that really predates um, Java. -E. I don't see a significant amount of usage of it outside of kind of the older um, uh, legacy applications. Um, but um, you can configure the um, you can configure Quartz Scheduler to use the managed executor service with uh, the Quartz configuration that's shown right at, at the bottom of the page. So those are Quartz properties. You would configure Quartz with the thread executor of a work manager thread executor, and then you would um, uh, point it at the JMDI name of the work manager. And uh, then when you when you go in, you write your code, you write exactly the same code as you had before. Um, you can do your lookups inside of your um, constructor, and then the execute method can make use of the, what you've looked up in the constructor. Um, this kind of surprised me, but uh, uh, apparently in web search traditional, um, your context um, that uh, the context that's carried across is only carried across for your jobs constructor. It's not carried across for the um, ex execute method. Um, but this is this is exact, exactly consistent with that behavior. Um, so it will work the same in Liberty and, and traditional web search. The last thing I wanted to talk about is the Jax RPC pre-deployment tool. Now, um, Jax RPC is probably the number one um, issue for um, existing applications. Um, applications that were built um, uh, of, of a certain age, uh, which is a lot of the applications deployed to WebSphere, um, used web services. And uh, at the time, the web service API available was Jax RPC. Although Jax WS came out later, um, a lot of you know a lot of those pre-existing applications didn't transition to Jax WS. So we we when we look at the my data from applications running on um, 
running on 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 Wednesday traditional, uh, the data we have suggests something in the region of 45 to 50 percent of all of those applications are using JAXR PC in some way. And that is a big inhibitor to getting those applications to run on um, Liberty. And, you know, we, we spent a lot of time kind of trying to work out what the best way to manage these. Um, and we decided in the end that rather than try to implement uh, Jack's RPC, which would mean a brand new SOAP stack uh, with all of the implications of having a brand new SOAP stack, um, uh, especially one that is old enough to support the Jack's RPC APIs, uh, we decided a better thing for us to do would be to build a, 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 a tool that can be integrated into your application's uh, build process to effectively convert your JAX RPC application into a JAX WS one. So the, the idea is you have your existing JAX RPC application, you build your JAX RPC application, and then you add some simple changes into your Maven or Gradle build process. And when you run the build, um, that will mean that will convert your uh, your JAX RPC application into a JAX WS one, and then your JAX WS one can, can be run on Webster Liberty or Open Liberty using the JAX WS feature. In fact, um, in theory, on paper, this should be able to work on Webster Traditional, but it turns out that there are some um, differences between how JAX RPC runtimes work and how JAX WS runtimes work. And those those changes to make sure you don't see any issue with that to basically make uh, the Liberty Jax WS work like the um, uh, traditional uh, Jax RPC one. They were made to Liberty and not rolled into to Webster traditional for a whole bunch of reasons. Um, the the conversion isn't one hundred percent, so it's not the case that one hundred percent of applications that use Jax RPC will absolutely be able to use this tool in order to move across. Um, but we believe we've got to got it to a significant percentage. So you know, eighty ninety percent of Jax RPC applications we think should move. And um, if 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 you want to pick this up and have a go and kick the tires with it, and you find it doesn't work, we're more than willing to hear. Um, from you, but this gives a path forward for the Jax RPC applications. It doesn't require you to rewrite all of those Jax RPC applications as Jax WS. Um, the to, in order to use the plugin, uh, you would download it from Fix Central. I've included a link to the support uh, page um, that details all of the versions. There's a, there's a couple of different versions out there right now. Uh, um, so, and it, it, it lists links into Fix Central for all of them. And you download the version you want to use, um, and then you would um, install it into the Maven repository. And I just realized um, I've made a slight error because um, the next slide assumes you're using the most recent version of the plugin, and this assumes you're using the first version of the plugin. Um, I, I, I would strongly recommend you use the, the, the most recent version of the plugin rather than the one mentioned here. Once you've installed it into your Maven repository, um, you add the following into your project Maven POM. Um, you want, uh, which is uh, the plugin into the build section, uh, defines the um, the group ID, the artifact ID, and uh, the version number of the plugin. And then you configure it to run the replace Jax RPC in whichever phase of the build you decide what is makes most sense in this example i've done it in the package phase which means the goal should run after your application has been packaged um i, I haven't I, you know i have to check uh, i'd have to check to make sure this is 100 percent correct and i will do that before distributing the slides um but this is how you would run the replace jacks or pc one there is also a target or a goal which is document in the documentation which will scan your application and tell you whether or not the tool can actually do the conversion so if you want to run that against an existing air file before or warfi before you run um the um this this tool uh, that's that to find out if it will work sorry um, that that's perfectly valid and possible for you to do. You would just uh, uh, change the goal to a different goal. Um, with that, that's the end of the uh, what's new section. Um, uh, so the next, uh, I'll just go kind of cover the last few slides before we go into questions. Um, 
So we have um, a whole load of um, uh, open liberty guides. The, it says there are 52, but in actual fact, I discovered uh, this morning, a little too late to update the charts, there's actually 55 guides. And the most recent guide is in fact a guide on using Podman rather than Docker. Um, I, you know, since when we originally, uh, last year, um, end of last year, Docker decided to start charging subscriptions for access to Docker for desktop, which uh, means that we wanted to investigate whether or not our guides could work with something other than Docker for those people who who don't have the uh, the don't have access to Docker for desktop anymore. So we've got a guide for how to use Podman instead of Docker. Um, as always, we've got a whole load of um, useful links um, in the resources section. And um, the, the, the next quarterly update, um, so you will have to forgive me. Um, apparently, I completely messed up. Uh, on June 23rd, um, we're going to hold a update for 22.0.0.4 to 6. Um, I thought I'd updated all of these details in this chart, but um, yeah, we will be. Um, so in June 23rd and June 30th, um, we will be doing a, um, a, a, a an update. And I have a horrible feeling those times are also wrong. Um, I must have. OK, <laughs> so. June 23rd and 30th, is this correct? Um, I will make sure this slide is up to date before we distribute it after the call. Um, and uh, the last thing, if if uh, we have this um, thing called the, the Customer Advisory Board, um, it's an opportunity for you to um, find out about what is happening um, with the um, uh, with WebSphere and, and Liberty and provide perspectives and input on uh, what we're doing. Um, if you want to get register, um, there's a link on this slide uh, and an email address of somebody you can contact. Uh, there is a non-disclosure agreement that needs to be signed, but I mean, predominantly that's so uh, if you give a, say, we'd like you to do X, uh, we can actually do X. Um, and with that, I'd like to see if there are any questions. Uh, Lars, uh, do we have any questions? Yeah, so the first one has been already answered about just RPC, and this is what we see a lot at, at our customers when they use confirmation advisor, for example, that uh, many of the challenges are around just RPC, if they want to migrate from traditional to liberty. Another question was around uh, uh, common J timer, and uh, there's a question, uh, so if I have existing traditional bus code, do I have to change the code uh, to fit to the uh, to the code uh, example that you uh, provide or is it the same code? No, 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 no. It, it, you don't have to change any code. The whole purpose of that is to enable those applications to work without code changes. So I just gave a, a very simple example of what the APIs look like. Um, uh, uh, but you know, if you've got code using those APIs, they should work exactly as they did before with no changes. Mm -hmm. Okay, good. So next question, uh, in WebSet Traditional, our node agent makes sure that our servers keep responsive. Uh, what do we provide in Liberty? I know that we provide something like a Liberty service for Linux. So is this approach that we would uh, recommend or? Sorry, um, well, I'm Linux? not sure I followed the question. So, uh, well, in, in traditional, we have this node agent who makes sure that uh, our process okay. is, is no longer responsible, will be kicked off and restarted. Yes. So in, yes. in Liberty, the customers have the challenge that if the server stops, uh, there's nobody monitoring the server. So if, if you're using Liberty ND, you can configure the collective controller to do exactly the same thing using mm -hmm. the auto scaling uh, capability. So there's a scaling controller and scaling member feature that you can configure. And then what will happen do that, that what will then happen is the collective controller will spot that the server has gone down and cause it to be restarted. But it doesn't make use of a node agent because Liberty's uh, ND topology is designed around an agentless approach. So we just need to be able to SSH to the target machine um, from the collective controller um, machine to do do our stuff. We don't actually 
uh, run a, an agent like the node agent to to achieve that. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you. So next question also about the migration from uh, to Liberty. And the question is about remote EGBs. Uh, so there are some rumors still that uh, Liberty does not support remote EGBs, but uh, what is the main difference between uh, Liberty and traditional bars and clusters regarding re remote EGBs? Um, so Liberty does support remote EGBs. Um, there are some, there are though limitations. So the probably the most significant one with Liberty is if you're making a, a, an, a remote call from one JVM to another JVM, we don't do transaction propagation. Um, and the the second prob the second one is there's some workload management capabilities in a Webster traditional cluster that don't exist in Liberty. So what that means is that uh, when you're trying to call an EJB in a cluster in a Webster traditional, uh, there will be a decision made as to which server to route that EJB call to um, to balance the workload appropriately across them. And there isn't an equivalent of that in Liberty. So I think those are the two biggest kind of differences. Mm -hmm. But but transaction propagation does work if the remote EJBs are actually in the same JVM. <laughs> same set. Yeah. 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 This, this is a workaround. We also use the customer where we said, okay, then put uh, two ES, for example, into the same uh, Liberty. They wanted to go into containers, for example, because uh, remote EGBs also provide a challenge if you go in containers at all, because uh, we don't have the workload management as we have for inbound HTTP. If you go into containers and want to go a remote EGB call from outside the container world into the container world. So. Okay, so next question I think is for you, Graham. Uh, how do we position Liberty uh, versus Quarkus regarding cloud native application? Okay, um, so um, I mean both both run run times have been designed for cloud native applications. Um, we focus on kind of the, so li Liberty is very good for. Um, a broad spectrum of uh, of runtime options, going from kind of full uh, full monolithic applications all the way down to microservices. Uh, a lot of people that we talk to aren't necessarily going to microservices, so they want they they want the full capabilities for for writing monolithic applications. But maybe they're they're using containers, they're doing um, continuous integration, continuous delivery for those applications. They're not just they're just not prepared. Um, to kind of bite the bullets and go down to to breaking that into microservices or even writing microservices from scratch, maybe organizationally or uh, that they're not kind of uh, set up or prepared for that. Um, Quarkus's focus is really um, on kind of uh, the the microservice um, end of the end of the world, also not really um, uh, focusing on enabling existing applications to be moved across onto Quarkus. They they have a they, they support microprofile, but then the rest of the APIs are kind of um, open source project APIs that are assembled into into that environment rather than with Liberty, our focus is on supporting the standard APIs. So things like Java e, Jakarta e, and microprofile so that your applications can be portable. We also focus on getting the best performance out of a, an environment, but running in a JVM. So that means that um, throughput can be better optimized um, when you're running in a JVM and you're running uh, running Liberty for workloads that are maybe going to be running for a, for a little while. Um, whereas Quarkus is uh, one of the big focuses on compile to native where you get um, kind of, uh, I guess, fast response time, but not necessarily high throughput. Uh, because the, there's no um, no further optimizations or limitations on optimizations that can be done um, beyond the kind of beyond what's done when you first compile that application to native. Mm -hmm. Another question in this area, uh, so with uh, Quarkus, uh, that there's a lot of focus on the fast start of the application server. Uh, I saw that with Liberty, we have something called Trio. Is it going in the, the same directory uh, direction or? Um, so Cryo is a, an interesting approach. So Cryo is checkpoint restore in user space, um, which is the ability to take a snapshot of a process in a, running in a, in a Linux environment. 
and then reconstitute that process. The, the idea being that um, you can maybe, if, if you used it for Liberty, you could start the Liberty server up, um, have some initialization things done, and then take a snapshot. And then next time you start it, it'll come up almost instantaneously, so essentially instant on. Um, that's an interesting approach that, uh, and, and I think we've done talks at conferences about kind of looking into that and showing kind of um, ex experiments showing Liberty, uh, Liberty um, using that approach. And we can actually start up a full Java e application from our, from our kind of tests. You can start up a full Java e application on Liberty in well, it, um, an application that took four seconds to start, um, which isn't particularly long. A full Java e application can start in about um, 400 milliseconds um, based on some initial experiments. And we think we can probably improve over that. So it's, it's, it's an interesting approach that we're looking into that we think um, can give us that kind of fast start capability without the compromise that you get with compile to native uh, where, um, uh, as I said, with the optimizations, because one, if you use cryo, you're essentially starting up the JVM again, you're reconstituting the JVM so you can get those performance optimizations as the run, as the, the JVM, uh, as the JIT um, does its work. Mm -hmm. And this cryo, uh, depending on uh, Jack Java, Eight or uh, Jakarta EE eight or Jakarta EE nine or can it also run with uh, Java EE seven? Um, so Cryo itself is independent of uh, of any kind of uh, I guess Java API set or anything. It, um, it's something that um, I think we're looking at from a kind of Semaru perspective in terms of uh, enabling that snapshotting, that kind of thing. So Semaru being the, the kind of IBM Java distribution. Um, I, I'm not aware of there being anything specific to kind of, uh, so so existing applications, if they're using Java E7, will be able to benefit it, benefit from it, um, mm. as well as Java E8, Jakarta E9, and so on. So it's more a configuration uh, part, not, not something I have to code it, something, correct? Yeah, it would be something you, you could do as part of a build process, for example. So in the same way I showed running that configure, uh, configure script as part of a Docker build, uh, maybe as part of your build process, you start the runtime up and snapshot it. And then when you come to put that into production, um, it would start um, essentially instantaneously. Mm -hmm. So in your demo, you showed the dev mode and something like this. Uh, is it something that is available as a guide as well? Uh, what, Cryo? No, uh, the Liberty dev mode and uh, uh, okay. mode. what you right. said in your demo. Yes, yes. Um, so... Um, yeah, the, the, if you go to openliberty.io slash guides, then uh, as Alistair said, there's 55 guides there now, um, and you can uh, you can search through those. There are ones that show show dev mode. I think I'm pretty certain, maybe uh, or maybe not. I, I'm, I think perhaps the uh, the getting started guide um, shows dev mode. It won't. Sh I don't think it shows it using Visual Studio Code, for example, um, but. Dev mode is enabled by the build plugin, so it's part of our Maven and Gradle capabilities. So you don't actually need an IDE; you could just use um, VI or Emacs or whatever your favorite text editor is, and you still get that rapid in a loop experience. The first, the first demo I ever did of Dev mode, I deliberately used VI to exactly <laughs> make that point because people don't expect using such a kind of basic editor, although Vi fans will probably bristle at me <laughs> saying basic editor. Um, yeah. But yeah, um, it, just people don't expect that from uh, Vi or Vim. Uh, so it was a deliberate choice. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you. So another question is in the direction of uh, uh, variables. So uh, you, you showed uh, that we have some enhancements now with uh, variables that can be resolved in the server.env. Uh, so if I want to define uh, variables overall, where should I define them? As a, as a default in the server.xml, and I could uh, put it in directory. So there are different approaches that I could use. But the question is, what, is that something what you would recommend? Um, so I, I generally would. So it depends on what your goal, like what your goal is. So I would generally say put as much as you can in server XML. Um, but uh, when you look at the resolution order, there's a resolution order on variables. And um, 
if you're going to deploy into a kind of Kubernetes environment, you quite likely want to be able to override it in a Kubernetes environment, either by um, using a config map bound as environment or as a file into the file system. And there, at that point, uh, you need to, you know, you need to customize kind of what you're doing. So a a variable whose value is in server XML, uh, kind of for historic backwards compatible reasons, always takes precedent. So I would say best thing to do is probably to define or in server XML as much as possible with a default value rather than a value. Because if you set the default value, it can be overridden at the other levels, but you know that it's always going to have a value. Um, and, and then you could override in, 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 pro, in production. So that's what I would tend to uh, suggest. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you. So are there any further questions? I do not see anything at the moment. At the moment, we don't have any further questions. So uh, one question regarding uh, Jakarta EE9 and the uh, older features, for example, for Java, for, for Java EE8, uh, can they be mixed, or is it something that we should do? No, it, it's it's an all or nothing. Uh, we we don't we haven't we haven't really allowed mixing of Java EE version features since uh, uh, Java EE7. And that caused a lot of complications and a lot of difficulty that ended up, you know, uh, we we allowed you to mix some six and seven items. And in ret retrospect, that was kind of a bad move because um, the number of different possible permutations that can get in, if you can combine arbitrary six, seven, eight and nine items is just so much that we wouldn't be able to provide a good level of confidence on quality. So um since um uh, for, for eight and up we've not allowed mixing and matching mm -hmm. another question in this area so if we uh if my customer wants to go to uh, java 17 should we go to jakarta ee9 or what is our recommendation um so that those two are kind of separated questions uh there is no requirement that they they, they, we we run the Jakarta E8 certification tests on Java 17, so and passed. So we, we'll, we'll you don't need to upgrade if you want to run Java 17. Um, the the reason you might wish to upgrade um, to Jakarta E9 is um, is because you you want to set yourself up to be able to consume newer versions of Jakarta E. Or you want to switch to the newer implementation of Jacks RS, which um, is more efficient than the old implementation. So when you use Jakarta E9, um, we have you pulled in Rest Easy as our uh, Jax RS runtime because we found it performed better. And although we'd done a lot of work to make CXF performance better, um, we were kind of running out of options to to get to to, to get it ahead of Rest Easy. So we decided with E9 we should just switch to uh, Rest Easy. And concentrate our efforts on making our integration with REST easy the best it could be, um, and that would be that might be a reason why people would want to move. If you've got a very REST heavy workload, um, you might get a ten. Well, I mean, it depends on what your scenario is. Um, you know, in theory, on you know, if, <laughs> on theory, you can probably get a significant performance boost, but in reality, by the time you actually do real work, you're probably looking more in the five to ten percent um, improvement. But five to ten percent might be significant for your workload. Mm -hmm. So I, let, I see a lot of customers uh, moving directly from uh, Java eight to Java seventeen now. Uh, do you see the same trend uh, in your areas? Um, I would certainly um, recommend customers look at Java seventeen at this point because Java eleven's end of support date is in two years' time. Mm -hmm. um, and you know that sounds kind of weird because Java eight support is not is after that, and you know we we're used to all of these things, um, you know, 
taking you know we're used to the idea that you know eight will go out before 11 before 17 but in actual fact um java 8's end of support is 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 is, is quite a bit out so I, I would definitely say if you're going to switch from eight to something, 17 is absolutely the right choice. So do you want to add something, Raham? No, um, and so, so I don't know that I've seen enough data to, to, to say whether that is what happening, what, what is happening, but uh, I think Al Alistair's recommendation is the right one. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So. I actually should have put this into the charts, but um, I wasn't sure if I, I was able to, but I have just checked. So um, Java, Liberty will stop supporting Java 11 in um, the 240010 release of Liberty. And I know that sounds like it's a long way away because we've just done 22003, but I know for a lot of customers who are planning a Java migration, that is not a huge amount of time. So, um, and uh, Java 8, on the other hand, it's slated, support slated to end on the 26.004 release of Liberty, which is, you know, about 18 months later. Mm -hmm. Thank you. So other comment in that direction. Uh, so we see also a lot of questions about the demo runtimes, uh, which demo runtime I should use, the open edition or the certified edition and uh, from uh, from my discussion with the field as well as with product management i got the statement that we should use the open edition if possible because then we have the flexibility to use it at, at, on any platform where you want to run it because you can run it on windows you can run it on linux and all the other uh, platforms as well including mac os which is not available for the certified edition so I I would I would kind of say also say the open edition um, is probably a kind of the better option of the two, um, but that's but not for that reason, um, but because the open edition comes out faster than the certified edition does. So there's a whole bunch of extra work that needs to go into passing certification. Um, and that that means that it it, it there's a there's a gap between them being released. So that's why I would say open because you know if you're going to move up, why wouldn't you move up to the most recent um, version? And that's probably going to be an open one. Mm -hmm. Okay. So I do not see any further questions. Is there is Anything you want to have as a final word? Um, well, I'd like to say thank you for everyone who tuned in for the live stream, especially those who had the patience to uh, wait until they got over the technical um, difficulties. Um, I, I understand that this will be available to kind of watch a second time. Um, so if you did miss part of the beginning of this, um, then you can always kind of go back and, and rewatch to catch up. But thank you for sticking with us. Yes, thank you. <laughs> yeah. and thank you to you, Alistair and Graham for your great work and for the presentation and uh, answering all the questions. And thank you, Lars, for the qu great questions. Yeah, thank you. <laughs> <laughs> okay.